I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all to our event tonight. Uh, let me start by acknowledging traditional owners of the land on which we speak. Um, which is the Wurundjeri people, and pay our respect to their elders past, present, and their families. Um, I'd like to also personally add my support to the recognition of our First Nations people uh, within the constitution through the referendum, which is now only a couple of weeks away. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce you tonight with the theme, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm too short, I'm gonna see over the top of it. <laughs> um, uh, in a theme tonight of our emerging leaders in science and technology, we have three great speakers here who've recently won awards through the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. Uh, and it also is great to see here we have a number of people through the IMNIS program who've joined us tonight. So uh, really great to see people connected to ATSI who are you know, emerging in this space. Uh, so the three speakers tonight will each give a short presentation and then we'll have a bit of a panel session. Uh, so I'll introduce all three of them to you first. So uh, the first speaker is Dr. George Chen, who's a lecturer in chemical engineering at the University of Melbourne and a principal engineer within the Dairy Innovation Hub. His work's been recognised with many awards, including the 2022 ICM Agri-Food Award from ATSI, uh, the 2022 Applied Research Award from the Membrane Society of Australasia, and the 2019 uh, Outstanding Industry Engagement Award from the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Laura Downey is an Associate Professor and Dane Kate Campbell Fellow for Research Excellence in the Department of Optometry and Vision Sciences in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Did I get that right? <laughs> uh, she's director of the inaugural Melbourne Cochrane Centre for Evidence-Based Vision Care, one of nine such centres globally recognised for excellence in leading the translation of high quality research evidence into eye care practice. In 2018, she was recognised by Optometry Australia as the youngest of 32 female luminaries to have pioneered optometric research. And she received uh, the ATSI David and Valerie Solomon Award in 2022. And finally, Jefferson Lamb is a second year PhD candidate at Monash University. His work aims to engineer the next generation of lightweight solar panels by drawing inspiration from plant leaves, which is the original solar energy harvester. His research so far has caught the attention of the nation with Jefferson being the 2022 recipient of the Ezio Rosario uh, Poly Polymer Scholarship, and his research is also supported by the Woodside Monash Energy Partnership Research Scholarship. So as I say, well, they're each going to give an overview of their, uh, their research. Think of some questions as you go for them, uh, and then we will have a panel session where you'd be welcome to ask those questions. So over to you, George. Thank you, Sandra. Good evening, everybody. So I would like to introduce myself again as a chemical engineer here. Um, I have worked with um, Sandra for a number of years. By now, yeah. um, and I basically have been working in both the engineering consulting, consulting and also the research and development um, sectors for the last 10 to 12 years. And what I've been doing in my research uh, mainly was to work with industry partners to help resolve their environmental challenges. So just to give you an example here, um, the two main challenges that are facing the their industry in the past five to 10 years were really the acidity and salinity. So if you're not from dairy processing, it's just a snapshot of what um, happens when you have milk and you want to convert that into yogurt or cheese. You have the different byproduct stream on the right hand side there, which I highlighted. And with the athlete wave, for example, um, you cannot do much with it other than feeding the animals or just disposing it into the trade waste, just because it's got a lot of acidity in there. Similarly, the salt, the salty way, um, you cannot do much do too much about it. Again, just because you have a lot of sodium chloride salt in there. And the majority of my work um, in the last couple of years is really to look at the different technologies, which hopefully could separate out some of those acidic and saline 
components from the byproduct streams so that the industry could recover the proteins and the real sugars and all those useful um, natural compounds from milk. Um, without going into any technical details, what I want to highlight is that we've looked at mainly membrane systems in the past. And on the right hand corner down here, um, we will basically look at all those technologies. On the left hand side, uh, we are named them as membrane systems. So, a lot of work going on in the last couple of years, uh, interacting with the industries, understanding their needs, and trying to make sure our research would adjust their needs as well as to hopefully help them. Um, solve the problem by generating extra revenue and reducing the cost of the waste disposal. Just to give an example in helping them to remove the acids from acid waste, um, we could potentially help the Australian dairy industry generate multi-million dollar of revenue um, you know, in one year. Um, so other than protein recovery from acid waste would um, potentially help them to reduce energy footprint in processing their um, other waste streams and also Make the use of the um, waste brine in, in the other streams as well. So you might have a, you know um, impression that I'm a client researcher. What I want to position myself in is not that I only um, am I a applied researcher. I want to be someone who can bridge the fundamental research and applied research, also the end users as well. Um, there's always a knowledge gap between end users and fundamental research where people understand how they want to put the materials, for example, into something that's really going to be useful one day in industry. Um, upscaling is always a challenge and also sometimes downscaling also is important. You find an industry challenge, you want to downscale it to something that you can work in the lab. Um, sometimes it's not easy. So I've basically done research along the way, uh, you know, through the uh, this flow map here um, in the different areas, but again, mainly on membrane separation technologies. In basically applying the similar philosophy, what I also um, been doing is to look at whether I can apply my uh, capabilities to other areas of the industries, for example, the food and beverage industries broadly. Um, I've been having projects on plant-based proteins and looking at uh, also, how we can add value to the size streams in the fermentation, so that's in the future food themes when we want to consider alternative proteins in the future. I uh, also got projects going on uh, with uh, clean energy sort of space as well, looking at how we can, uh, for example, um, separate CO2 um, from different carbon sources effectively. So with that, I just want to yeah, finish my introduction here, and thank you so much to be here. And we'll let Laura come up next. It looks like there's some technology changes <laughs> going along with that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be here tonight. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, so I'm a clinician scientist and a practicing optometrist uh, and established my own research group in 2013. Uh, and we're the anterior eye clinical trials and research translation unit. So we have 14 members in our group uh, with interdisciplinary expertise. So we have clinicians, fundamental scientists, and even engineers. Um, and broadly our aim is to make discoveries about the ocular surface, to identify new biomarkers to detect and monitor disease, and also to evaluate new therapies uh, to improve our care. And so our work aims to have a strong translational focus, but we integrate discovery research, clinical studies, and implementation science. And this is across three major areas. The first is how we can use the eye as a window to help. We undertake clinical trials of new drugs and devices to improve care. And we also have an arm that is specifically about uh, supporting the translation of evidence into practice. And so I'm going to share a brief snapshot about each of these three main themes. So our current focus of the lab is to investigate how we can use the cornea, which is a transparent surface at the front of the eye, 
as a window to immune health in humans. So we've recently developed a new imaging method, which we term functional in vivo confocal microscopy, or fun IVCM, and that's shown here. So what we do is we take non-invasive images that are time-lapsed of the human cornea in patients, and we can capture the dynamics of different types of immune cells. So in doing this, we've been able to show that there are T cells, which are those cells that you can see swimming around there, dendritic cells, and macrophages in the cornea. Now, the cornea is the only place in the human body where we can actually directly and non-invasively see these cells. And so what's really exciting is that in using this approach and marrying that with more basic experimental approaches using human donor tissue, we've actually been able to completely redefine our understanding of the cell types that exist in the cornea. And so this has recently been published in PNAS, and it identifies the presence of T cells, which we know are adaptive immune cells, um, that have been misclassified as dendritic cells. And so it really shifts the current dogma in the field. And we're really excited to see how we can use this technique as a tool to better understand the eye and systemic immune health. So we're currently looking at a range of different research and development areas. We're keen to work with some software engineers to develop an automated tool so that will be much more streamlined cell analysis. And this will be an enabler for use in clinics and industry. We have a biomarker platform. So we're interested in understanding how we can use this information about immune cells to tell us about ocular and systemic disease. And another really interesting element is how we can use this as a tool to measure therapeutic outcomes in patients. So it might be possible to personalise the use of immunotherapies based on what we see in the cornea um, and in terms of the changes in those cell dynamics. The second major area of discovery research is how we can use our tears as a platform for understanding health. And so this links the analysis of tear composition with a person's health status. So tears are actually very complex. There are 2,000 components in tears, and we know we can non-invasively sample them at microliter volumes, and because they're highly concentrated, uh, we can get meaningful biomarker analyses from the tears. So in this area, we kind of have two main streams of research, an academic stream, which focuses on fundamental biology. So as an example, we've collaborated with researchers at the Doherty Institute to define mucosal antibody responses in things like COVID and flu and HIV, and we can do that in tears. And we've also been working with clinicians to look at how we can better phenotype different forms of the inflammation in the eye using markers in the tears. We then have an industry-engaged stream of research, which has more patented types of findings. And this is for biomarkers that we think can be used to transform care. So personalised medicine, developing point-of-care tests. So we've worked with the contact lens industry to understand how people's tears are different when they experience contact lens discomfort. It's a major problem in the industry. And so we, if we can work out who's vulnerable to that, we can better manage them and hopefully allow them to be successful contact lens wearers. We've identified a neuropeptide in the tears that can uh, identify early stage peripheral neuropathy, which affects the hands and feet in people with diabetes. And this really addresses a challenge in the field uh, that often these patients are diagnosed very late when treatments are less effective. Um, and that's due to the limitations of the standard neurological tests. And finally, we're also developing a new point of care test, ADMIRE, uh, which is what we're fortunate to receive the David and Valerie Solomon Award for, which is to advance the diagnosis of dry eye disease. So ADMIRE stands for Acoustically Driven Microfluidic Extensional Rheometry and involves a clinician collecting a one microliter tear sample from a patient's eye. We then analyze that on our device, which looks at the viscoelastic or stretching properties of that tear droplet and allows us to fully characterize the health of the tears. This information can then be used by the clinician to stratify the type of dry eye and that then allows the clinician to know which treatment will be best for that patient. So our goal is to develop ADMIRE as a one-step point of care test to rapidly and accurately diagnose and subtype dry eye. Um, we've already had a chat about dry eye a bit tonight, 
It's a very common condition. It has substantial health burden, but currently lacks accurate, non-invasive and efficient diagnosis. So we have granted patents for this technology and have demonstrated the validity of the biomarker to diagnose and subtype dry eye on a laboratory prototype. And we've also been able to demonstrate that our technique has superior accuracy to all other current tests. So very high accuracy to identify dry eye and importantly, to delineate that subtype, which we know is essential for informed and effective therapeutic prescribing. The other major advantage is the speed. So we can achieve all of this information in less than three minutes, which is one sixth of the time that it would take a clinician currently to perform a battery of tests. So we have a comprehensive and multidisciplinary team. Uh, so this is a collaboration with Professor Leslie Yeo from RMIT University. And together our team has expertise in optometry, dry eye, commercialization. And we also benefit from a really generous advisory board who are providing input into other aspects such as commercialization strategy, regulatory strategy, and intellectual property. We're currently pursuing funding uh, for kind of the next stage uh, where we're looking to develop an integrated device uh, with the aim that we'll progress this technology towards market authorization. The other aspect of our research program is a large clinical trial program. So this includes investigator-initiated studies with other clinicians, and that's really where most of the PhD projects fall. We also undertake academic industry collaborative work, and that can help translate some of our laboratory-based discoveries uh, into practice, and then have an industry-sponsored trial program. And that ranges from first in humans to post-marketing studies, from single to multi-centers um, studies, and we engage both with larger pharmaceutical as well as smaller startup companies through that work. And finally, um, our evidence synthesis and translation domain involves working closely with Cochrane, uh, who are a non-for-profit organisation who aim to support evidence-based choices about healthcare interventions. So we've been partnering with Cochrane for about 10 years and became one of their Melbourne Cochrane Centres for Evidence-Based Vision Care. This collaboration that we have is also the foundation for enhancing the reach and impact of a new online free platform that we've developed uh, called Crowdcare or Crowdsourcing Critical Appraisal of Research Evidence. So this platform uses crowdsourcing to teach clinicians, students, journalists how to, re how to appraise research studies. And so it enables the appraisal of any citation in the PubMed database. Um, and with engaging with Cochrane, we've been able to expand our user base so that it's international. I have about 4,000 articles that are currently graded uh, in that system. And finally, as a slightly different example of knowledge translation, uh, last month we published a Cochrane systematic review looking at blue light filtering lenses for eye strain. Some of you might have seen this. Um, it led to substantial media attention. Um, so we had articles in the New York Times, Washington Post, the conversation, interviews with different members of the team um, on various radio and television stations. So it's been a bit of fun. Um, but I think it's kind of highlights an important aspect of what we do. And it is really important that we can share our clinically important findings or other findings that impact society um, for a broader audience. So this work happens with a fantastic team, uh, some of which are shown here, also many collaborators, some of which are listed here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have ARC and the HMRC funding, uh, as well as through industry, which supports the clinical trial work. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And last but not least, Jefferson. Good evening, everyone, and thank you again to ASI. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks, George. Your research is very interesting, despite being lactose intolerant. Uh, and, and thank you, Nora. Your, your research does bring a tear to my eye. <laughs> So I'm a, a second year PhD student from Monash University. Um, and 
as you can see from the title, uh, my, my work focuses on lightweight solar panels or lightweight photo photovoltaics and really sort of deciphering what the key degradation mechanisms of them are and coming up with some um, potentially unique and interesting solutions um, for those degradations. Uh, my supervisors are Professor Yas Yasek Yashiniak and Dr. Machi Gressel. Um, and to begin, I'm sure it doesn't need much of an introduction, but um, but solar panels are, are so needed. Um, we are amidst a climate crisis and a global energy crisis. Um, we need more solar panels and we need it, it faster than ever. And a key driver to that is the cost. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing the sort of shift um, from the current architecture of solar panels based on, on glass as a cover sheet to something more lightweight, something um, more, more thin, um, which has, I guess, um, flow on effects to its, its cost. Um, and this is replacing the glass component with the polymeric components. So we've, we've, we've sort of known about this architecture of solar panels for a while now, um, 30 plus years, as you might have heard on the news, they're coming up to the sort of end of life of many solar panels that have been ma manufactured 30 years ago. And there's sort of um, build up a recyclability issue there. Um, and one of the, yeah, one of the biggest things is that they have quite a low power dens density actually due to their heavy um, nature. And so more and more we're seeing companies come up with sort of lightweight solutions, lightweight strategies um, and this sort of has evolved from the sort of hobbyist applications in, in camping or in, um, yeah, where lightweight solutions where you put on your boat or your RV, that sort of thing, um, that sort of replace the glass with polymeric materials and um, allow the, these solar panels to be two times, three times uh, lighter. And this this light extra lightweight allows for a high power density. You can ship more. Um, so we like to use this metric, it's power per shipping container. It's, it's actually quite important um, in terms of the cost. Um, so we can fit more panels in a shipping container. Uh, they're lighter, so you can deploy them um, with less labor. Um, and especially in Australia, the labor costs are quite high. Um, you don't need as many structural materials to support them. And additionally, you can you can deploy them in, in more locations, so um, sort of on on vehicles, on trucks, and trains, sort of the facades of buildings. Um, there's a lot of factory rooftops, um, even dairy farms actually, um, that don't have the structural support for solar panels, traditional solar panels, which are really heavy. Um, when you mount it on the roof, there's a lot of uh, implications with um, the forces that they, they experience, especially the uplift force from wind. Um, and so lightweight solar panels provide all these, these solutions for um, an extra application to solar panels. So my work, more specifically, um, is sort of split into three key areas. Um, I'm only one of uh, two years into my PhD almost. Um, so the, the sort of last few chapters are, are not super finalized just yet. Um, but the first two are, are pretty much pretty much getting there. Um, so the first one is actually doing a deep dive into the degradation of lightweight solar panels. And there's actually not so much research or uh, publicly available research out there as it's, it's a field that's already been commercialized. Um, there's a lot of patents involved. And sort of um, coming up with a, a set of materials, a set of architectures, of lightweight solar panels and, and testing them um, under standard tests. So the IEC standards for solar panels um, and trying to pinpoint what are the key degradation mechanisms. So is it humidity? Is it UV light? That's the, the primary driver of the degradation. Is it a combination of that or thermal cycling or um, abrasion, hail? There's, there's a whole lot of factors um, that come into play here. And so my, the first area of my research looks into these. 
The second area, um, you may have heard a bit in my introduction, talking about sort of the bio-inspired solutions for um, some of these problems. So, so far we already know that one of the key drivers to degradation is UV, um, as polymers degrade quite severely under UV and humidity. So um, the, the cuticle, the plant cuticle, sort of has um, remar remarkable properties in terms of moisture barrier as well as UV protection. So my in this area, my research looks to um, sort of emulate or mimic in the, the composition of the plant leaf cuticle and sort of apply that as a coating onto these lightweight photovoltaics um, and assessing their performance over time. Um, and I also have some side projects that I'm that's sort of um, starting up just now, um, looking at um, highly durable hybrid silica coatings, um, as well as vitrima encapsulation. Um, so vitrimas are a type of polymer that can be really easily sort of recycled, but has the benefit of um, having all these properties of, of these covalently cross-linked rubbers, uh, elastomers, um, but then these can be reversed and um, be recycled. So um, addressing that sort of recyclability issue there. So I've sort of kept this short and sweet, but that's about it for mine. And I'll sort of just end with um, just sort of question to, to you guys. Um, I, I, I think I know the answer to this um, because I'm young and naive, but I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to sort of hear from you guys what, what you think about um, a lightweight solar panels, the future. Um, and these images um, are actual images of li lightweight solar panels being sort of deployed in the last few years. So um, it's, it's quite cool to see. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you to all three of our speakers to come up. Um, and we'll stop sharing the screen. We get Malik to do that. Um, and I, I really, we want to make most of the panel session uh, around some of the challenges facing young people, such as we have here. But I thought I'd kick off by asking whether anybody has any questions about the technical technical questions about what's just been presented or whether there's anything you'd like to ask any of our speakers about their presentations in general before we get into technical questions. Yes, go for it. This is for Laura. And I I only knew of that uh, well um research in your and body. Yeah. And I was just wondering um, how people can do details in the digital. Yeah, so that's a great one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So the question is around how it has been possible to confuse dendritic cells and T cells in the human cornea. And it really relates to how the research started. So most of the phenotyping of cells has actually been done in mouse corneas. Now, in the mouse healthy cornea, T cells don't exist. There are only dendritic cells. And so it's been long assumed that what we see in laboratory models is translatable to humans. And so when images of the human corneal immune cells were captured, initially they were just static images until we developed this technique. And so people were classing the different shaped cells as dendritic cells of different maturity states. So we had immature and mature dendritic cells. And then we developed this dynamic imaging and we started talking to Professor Scott Muller at the Bowie Institute. And we're looking at these cells and we're calling them dendritic cells. He's like, how do you know they're dendritic cells? I'm like, well, that's kind of what we always say. He's like, I don't think they're dendritic cells. He works in T-cells. And so that kind of just started a whole body of research and then no one had really looked at human glioma cornea tissues for T cells because it had been assumed they're not there and so when you look back in time there are lots of kind of assumptions that were made around the human cornea so it's kind of one of those serendipitous projects that happens when you talk to someone outside your field and yeah it's been really fun working on it. Go on very quickly. Um, 
Um, Margaret, you have a, a question? Just for Jeff or someone else. Yes. Um, sure. Hormones, do I have um, self cleaning um, capacity from the pelvic floor when the um, pelvic hurts? Is there one or the other cross between large bowel panels and, and the new? But hopefully, there's a good one to treat having fever once a year coming to clean them. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, so, the self cleaning property comes. Um, uh, can stem from an, a number of different um, attributes of the surface. Um, but one of the things you can achieve using polymers is um, high hydrophobicity. Um, and high hydrophobicity comes from two things. It comes from uh, micro and nanoscale roughness of the surface, um, but also a low surface energy. So um, in my coding, in my bio spiral coding, um, plants actually do this tremendously. Um, because the wax, the cuticle is actually very waxy, um, long, long chain hydrocarbons that have that impart great hydrophobicity. And they're also, the surface is also very, very rough. Um, so using polymers um, by itself, um, you, you, you wouldn't be able to sort of achieve these self cleaning properties, but um, sort of applying a coating, um, and I'm working on sort of a composite coating, which is. Um, um, a polymer matrix with I'm using silica embedded to provide that roughness. Um, so I and my, my work has actually achieved quite quite good hydrophobicity, which um, is directly related to self cleaning. So, yeah. And Callum, yeah. yeah, I've also got a question for Jeff. Just for, so, so historically. Um, the reason why the inorganic side started on stage cells have been used is because they have very good stability. They don't fatigue in the same way as organic yeah. polymers or organic dye. Mm -hmm. Has the fatigue problem been solved for organic photovoltaic so you get long life? Um, I'm actually not too sure, but definitely not as long as inorganic such as silicon. It, I'm actually working with silicon. Um, Still, so this I'm I'm not really changing the solar cell technology in any way, um, but actually change, looking at the that encapsulation of it and changing that. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not I'm not too sure about the the inorganic. I mean the organic solar cells. Um, thank you. No okay, um, I think there are more technical questions, but let's come back a little bit. Um, uh, because we, what we wanted to move on to a little bit is also some of the challenges uh, that face young researchers like yourselves. Uh, and perhaps I'll start with George because he hasn't had a chance much to say anything here. If he wants to talk a little bit of the challenge probably facing all of you, which is how do you balance the need to engage with industry and you know have some impact with also the demands on a, a young researcher to publish in high impact papers and to and to meet, you know, the, the the requirements to get a job in this in this country, which seems to be to have a lot of publications. So, I uh, didn't want to talk about that, George. I think it's a very good question. So, I think uh, I will mention maybe two points, and that's how I've been um, doing this. So, the first one is to work very hard, <laughs> <laughs> and the second point is um, think hard. outside the box. So, let me put the, the bit of a context into this, right? So. Uh, you do need to work very hard because you need to go to the industry sites, talk to people, get the ideas, understand the needs and challenges, and come back and think of ideas and go back with 10%. And you do run experiments at the same time, and you sometimes you need to go to uh, the rural areas and collect samples so that they are fresh for your experiments. Sometimes you, you use a powder um, to represent milk. It's not the same as when you collect milk from a battery. So um, you do need to balance how much you want to invest into engaging with the industry and also think about, that's the thinking outside the box part, uh, think about how your research is also fundamentally applied to other industries as well. So let's give you an example, the, uh, the work that we did with the SCY was um, pretty much based on a membrane process that can separate charged species from neutral compound. Um, and that's by an emerging membrane technology. Um, and we later on um, 
figure out that that's a lot hasn't been done in the literature or in the space about understanding the fundamental transport mechanisms in those membranes. And those membranes were initially developed by, uh, for water treatment, and if you use it for uh, food application, it's going to be different because you have to already water this bit. Uh, if you're going to use it for lithium extraction, for example, it's not going to be different because you've got other um, rare uh, elements in there, um, or also some sort of, um, you know, um, BOC or COD from the different brine streams that you may, you know, you may want to see in the different um, brine sources as well. So we've been publishing quite a bit of, you know, working with Sandra as well, the team to publish quite a number of exam papers um, in the different journals, looking at just the fundamental transport mechanisms of those things. And just to finish off, I think we need to create a positive loop. Uh, we try to think out of the box, get us um, some really fundamental impactful papers, and that will get us into more research funding and more industry, um, you know, collaborations of course, and that hopefully is a um, viable route for us to, to survive. Thank you, George. Um, and I'm going to pass to Laura, who clearly is also working extremely hard based on what she's just presented. Um, and I think one we, we speaking as somebody who's more mature, there's increasing concerns that we hear from early and mid-career career researchers that the workload they carry is unsustainable. Um, so I'd be interested in your comments both of how you manage the large workload or if you don't, and therefore, and also open the discussion on how do we change this? How do we get to a point where the workload can be made sustainable or is that just not going to be possible? <laughs> a big question. <laughs> A big question. Um, so I think there's certainly increasing recognition of heightened workloads um, and challenges in, in with work-life balance in kind of modern academia. Um, I think what I've learned is that you've got to find what works for you um, in that kind of how you structure your life um, is an individual choice. And so what works for one person uh, might be quite different from another. Um, and so I think in academia, one of the benefits is flexibility, but it can also be one of the perils of academia because our work is what we kind of live and breathe. Um, but I did hear someone speak a while ago about a diff slightly different concept to work-life balance, and they coined this term, which I think is more broadly known, but it's work-life integration. And so when I think about my life, that probably resonates more with me. So that's about not trying to artificially compartmentalise work life and personal life, but to recognise that there can be best times to do certain aspects of your life. And it's okay if that works for you. And so with that, you can have synergistic elements of your life. Um, noting that sometimes you might need to prioritise your personal life and other times it might be your work life if you have deadlines or sufficient. And with that, you kind of break free from thinking, oh, I have to work this time and then my family time and my personal time is X time. And so I think that's how I do operate with kind of an integrated approach. Um, my family and my friends are really important to me. Um, so that's kind of my life. And I also have music. As a, oh, come on. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> as kind of another outlet. So I'm um, a classically trained musician. And so until recently had a string quartet and used to teach music. And so that was my outlet. It's kind of something away from science, but it's a challenge. And often I chat with earlier career researchers and I don't think there's a magic answer. Um, we all have lots to do. And if you're going to kind of pursue this career, you've got to work out kind of what works um, for you. Um, and I have got more questions, but I just know we have some other younger researchers here. Are there anybody would like to continue that conversation or make any other comments or questions about the whole workload issue? No, I've caught you up here. Go for it. Yeah. Deal with any I'm older than I look. <laughs> <laughs> I did my PhD 15 years ago, so I, I feel very fortunate. I do have a tenured teaching and research academic role. And so um, I'm fortunate now to have that job security, but certainly for my postdocs, um, this is a constant conversation we have. And I think it is something that we need to look to address as a, as a field or as a sector. 
um, to try and alleviate that uncertainty and that um, for earlier career people, I think it's getting harder and harder. Uh, George, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I echo every single point that Laura just made. If um, I could add a little bit to that, is that our industry does have a reputation out there. We work on the weekends, but every day is the weekend. So I guess that makes the point there that we are working really hard and in pursuing a work-life balance. Uh, myself, I've got two beautiful, lovely kids. Um, and I mean, over the years, what I've found is that I need to learn to be switched off when I need to and be there in the moment. I mean, that's really important, right? Um, kids will grow up very quickly uh, without you even noticing it. And being there with them, you know, in that moment is really important. And I've been practicing a lot in the early years um, and certainly get support from my mentors around me as well to give me the days of when I need to and actually, you know, go to sort out, you know, sick leave and, you know, sick kids and sick things like that. But you do need to have the, you know, the supportive environments around you, but also the community around you as well, not just the friends, your partners, and your family. But I think um, giving back to the community will give you some sort of rewarding experience in your mindset saying you're doing this great for the community. So I do have a hobby as well, um, and that's playing badminton, and I do manage a coaching gym to coach kids badminton all the weekend. So that's something I do enjoy as well, and that really, um, <coughs> You know, um, help me release some of the pressure um, when I work. Sorry. Because I was looking just when you hear Mr. Lara and George, what are you thinking about your future today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to say I can hear you. Yeah, um, um, I actually, I'm not sure what my future holds for me, and academia, academia certainly isn't ruled out. Um, but um, I'm definitely aware of all of the the sort of challenges, especially I think the the work life balance and work life integration um, isn't too much of a barrier for me. But it's more that yeah, that job insecurity, um, searching for that next bit of funding, that sort of um, and yeah, writing all these grants all the time. Like I see it um, in my peers, my my mentors, they're doing it and it stresses them out a lot. Um, um, some of it gets pushed down to me as well. Um, so I think that's more of a barrier. Um, as for the industry question, yes, um, I'm, I'm part of the Woodside Monash Energy Partnership. So um, I've got, I get some support with them, but I, I've also worked in this, I work a little bit with, within this um, team called um, Ultra Low Cost Solar, um, and it's, it's about a team of maybe four or five people um, looking to sort of um, strategize how we can deploy lightweight solar panels in an automated fashion um, and sort of have that um, sort of smaller scale uh, automation for temporary in installs or temporary um, solutions. Um, sort of, this is sort of comparable to di like diesel generators for maybe mining communities or emergency response or maybe even festivals or ac activities such as that. Um, seeing how we can sort of harness what lightweight solar panels can provide and that they're really um, easy to deploy and manage. And yeah, trying to figure out some solutions for that. So that's that's in the works at the moment. Um, and I I do have some ties within the industry, which is which is really great. Uh, you know, I think it's I think it's important to point out that most Australian PD PhD do not end up in that thing. They end up in government or they end up in in industry. And the graduate outcomes for Australian PhD is very good. Just got to uh, people on Zoom. Yeah, sorry. I, yeah. <laughs> don't, uh, so, for example, I, I work at RMIT. Yeah. Only twenty percent of our PhDs end up in academia, and we have an extremely high employment rate for our PhDs. And I'm sure Karen here is from Swinburne. I'm sure it's the same in Swinburne. Um, so we need to be careful how we describe the uh, 
you know, the employment pathways for PhD, you sometimes hear that Australia produces too much, too many PhDs, and that's based on an assumption that they end up in academia, and that's a false assumption, certainly from the, the evidence that, that I've seen. We actually need more PhDs, and we need more PhDs in government and in industry to, to help Australia become, you know, even more innovative than what we are now. Thank you, Callum. Have we got any other 30 questions? Yeah, there's a couple coming. Oh, you can't go to let these young people have a go. <laughs> okay, you can all go now. And hi, Laura. My name is Inha, and it's great to hear your talk. Uh, my question is about why do you still stay inactive? Because our lab is having a very similar situations for you. My supervisor is doing a lot of research and development, and we are working on blood based biomarkers for the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And he has developed a few products because he has already commercialized some of them and get paid them as well. And he is like really considering leaving academia after he has stayed in for 20 years. So um, given his influence on me, so I'm a bit um, confused whether I should stay in academia or just go to his industry with him. And I, I I wanted you to know your opinions because you are doing commercialization creating like similar trials as what we are doing right now. Thank you. You need to get a second mic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first thing I think, like for me, I feel I love my job. Um, I love being an academic, and I feel like it's actually a, a privilege to be an academic to be able to do things that I find interesting and have a team around me. Um, in terms of, I think one of the advantages now is that there is a lot more recognition about the value of industry-engaged research and commercialization. And many academics can have a successful academic career that runs in parallel with startups and other forms of translational activity. And so certainly even at the University of Melbourne, um, in the last few years, we've seen accelerator programs, commercialization networks, seed funding, even university-led VC funding to encourage academics to think outside the square and to actually undertake that activity in parallel with their more traditional academic research and teaching. And so, um, you know, we're looking to form a startup at some point, but uh, I won't be the person probably that leaves, I won't leave my academic role. Like I actually love the teaching element um, and think I can actually do both, hopefully. Um, and I think the university is encouraging us to think like that. Um, there are new funding schemes that en enable that. Um, there are lots of opportunities. So, and for someone starting out, I think the other thing to say is it's not kind of a black and white choice. People actually filter through industry, academia, you know, your career trajectory, um, you may end up doing both roles or simultaneous roles. So I think um, go with what really inspires you, what excites you, excites you um, and don't think of it as kind of a dichotomous choice. The things can actually have a lot of intersection um, and complement each other as well. Thank you. And now we've got two questions at the back. I'm going to go in order of which the hands went up. <laughs> Hi, uh, I had a question about like most of the most of us PhD students being young, we don't have experience in working in the same field. And uh, like some of my seniors, I have the same question right now. They have already graduated from their PhD. And even while they apply for a job, they always get rejected saying that we don't have experience. So how do we get that experience? Does anyone want to have a go at that one? Anyone in the audience would have a go at that one? Don't go, George. <laughs> Yeah, go. Um, so you are right. At, I actually had similar experiences um, a couple of years ago. So I think it's very important to recognize the transferable skills that will help develop during, during our PhD. Um, I understand that for companies, they're looking at specific skill sets that you can be on day one, do your job for them, and finish them within 24 hours or something. But the actual well, fact is, I think a lot of times, um, your skill sets that you build over the QM space, you can try managing your own projects that's project management, going to the lab, 
and practicing your, um, you know, doing your experiments, for example, that's the um, practical skills that you have. And the, the awareness of the safety around you is also very important. So it's about, again, thinking outside the box and think about what skills that you have built that can benefit that organization. And I mean, when you write a cover letter, it's probably also worth putting into a mindset that you want to create value for the company, not just to do that job that is described in detail in that you know, advertisement. So I think that's also important to get their value, um, that could get them to value your um, you know, background and your degree as well. Okay, and uh, is there, there's one on Zoom question, is there? No, no, okay. I'm gonna go here to this question. <laughs> Thank you to all panelists, it's wonderful talks. So my question would be, is there any advice on activities, programs, or any networks that us as PhD students should be aware of or engage with when we are in a field or doing a topic that does not have an obvious end user or an obvious commercialized commercialization or like end product or applicability in industry, which can potentially hinder our transition into an industry related role. Who wants to have a go at that? Jefferson? I mean, I'm a PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I definitely <laughs> feel your sentiment. Um, but I think as a PhD student, I, well, maybe it's just, it's just me as a person, I, I sort of just say yes, I can't really say no, I just say yes to everything. Um, and I think, I think it's good to, to do that and to, I guess, all the emails that you see, the random emails that you get, just open them and, and say yes. Um, and and who knows what? <laughs> not not the scam. You know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I feel like doing doing that and getting involved um, with the sort of communities at Monash. There's sort of postgraduate graduate committees and associations. Um, that are always looking for, for new people, new roles, different presentations and conferences that you that you can present at. I feel like all of these opportunities um, so far for me have really like allowed me to sort of expand my network and be more be more comfortable in where, where I'm at and where, where my future is heading. Um, so yeah, that's all I want to do that. But I, I, I'm in the same boat as well. So yeah. <laughs> I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. I think that's really good advice. Networking is really important. Um, it's kind of those um, serendipitous meetings that I often find that sometimes have the most value, like conversation with a poster or something with someone, and then that leads to something. And I think actually, compared to when I did my PhD, which is a while ago, there are so many more programs available for PhD students around complementary skills, so science communication innovation, enterprise, and those are usually interdisciplinary types of programs. So you'll meet people outside your field. Many of them have industry sponsors, many of them in industry. So I think the advice to say yes and take a risk um, is a really good advice. Uh, nothing else from you, George? No? No? <laughs> uh, um, I will just say we've got about five minutes left. Yeah. If there is anybody in Zoom who would like to ask a question, please post it in the chat. Uh, did you still have a question, Margaret? No, I don't Karen's got one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add a comment to the question about I don't have an experience if you want an experience, how do you fulfill a job? I was once in a session with undergrads and someone asked that question and a girl in the audience said, what I did was I applied for a job, I can say Ford, and uh, it was way above, you know, I knew that I wanted to think. But I wrote to them, I said, I see you've got, it's got a manager, I see you've got a job open. I'm not qualified, but if you're having trouble filling the role and you need someone to get things started, let me know. And you know, she got the job. And I just thought that was a really brilliant trick. It won't work every time, but it's a different way. Of <laughs> Such a, uh, I thought she was a genius to, to think yeah. that's rude. Um, and it's worth considering because the, often those ones with the you need what you're getting at is these expectations are unrealistic. So it is actually, if you see something, it might be that if you say, 
can't say you're being unrealistic, but you can say, if there's a cause finding the dreamboat candidate, I have also skills in computing, so it's worth it was worth a shot. I just thought it was such a genius thing from the audience. I thought I'm compelled to share it. It's really worth it. Uh, anybody else with burning questions? I have more questions here I haven't asked. Uh, I'll go to my list. Um, I suppose to Laura and George, having heard all this, looking back on your own PhD studies, what would you do differently to have prepared you better for where you are now? Or is it all perfect? <laughs> it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. I mean, again, going back to my point, I mean, back then, if I would appreciate if we were um, be able to recognize the transferable skills that we actually be developing, because we'd be always be immersing into our topic, you know, for so long. And we, when we get out there, we we'll just, you know, don't know what we can do in the future. And that's a lot of times, I mean, in the group, even having a few interactions, discussing around the peers about, you know, some of those topics would be really helpful. So networking is important, um, put it that way. And something that really, um, that was sort of not there when I was doing my PhD, which was way too long, was that we did not have the opportunity to actually um, communicate online. So after the whole world, I realized that that's a, that's a sort of new, new skill set that we to develop. So but fortunately, you guys now would have that of skill sets, you know, talking to the screen and answering questions, uh, that would be your um, strength by now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my PhD was actually in retinal cell biology, so I did a preclinical PhD, um, but now largely my work is clinical. Um, and so I think an advantage of that and thinking of it, you know, the, the topic you pursue for your PhD may not be the topic or even the, the field that you pursue for your postdoc or the career that you create. So kind of think big picture. Um, you're going to develop a whole lot of transferable skills and you can apply that in many domains. And I think I didn't really appreciate that at the time. You kind of think you're doing a project on a certain topic and I didn't necessarily realise the transferable skills that I was developing and that certainly um, something that you come away with and as we've said many people will go into industry or government um, and those skills are going to be extremely valuable there. I think when I did my PhD too there weren't the, the level of programs available for PhD students. Um, there's just so much on offer now. Every week I see another program and I'm actually mindful not to send too much to my graduate students and really try and pick the, the ones we think are most aligned to particular people. But um, looking back, I wish I'd had a chance to do things like science communication, um, learn more about patents and things. I didn't learn that until I was an academic. So having an understanding of you know, the commercial side would have been really great um, as a PhD student. Okay, oh, I've got a five in mind phone here, I just remembered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just got one last question and it's sort of for all of you. Um, and it, it it relates though to what Laura was saying that she's had nine hundred media articles in the articles in the media in the last month. Uh, I just like your opinion and, and how important you think it is to engage with the mainstream media and how do you cope when you see articles that are patently false in the in the media? Uh, and what do you think your responsibility is here to engage with the public? Um, Jefferson, off you go first. I mean, I don't really have too much experience with that. Um, but I think, I think morally, there is an obligation as an expert in the field to sort of um, express your opinion and, and sort of share that. But I also think that as a, like a researcher or a PhD student, I would have, be, I'd have, I'd have no idea on how to sort of talk to the media. And um, I'm just like scared of, of getting, <laughs> getting my words just mixed up and taking um, my quotes out of context, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, I think science communication is a very important skill to, to have as a, a scientist. Um, I, do, I do think that is a, it's a bit lacking, especially in, in like the PhD program, um, sort of communicating with not just your, your scientific peers, but the general public. Thank you, Jeff. So you pass it over, Laura. You all get your last word on this one. 
Um, so I think that um, we do have a, a role to play, a really important role to play, um, to share our science and to make sure we get evidence out there. Um, I've only been engaging with the media in the last three or four years, so I think it takes time. Um, and I've had some pitching, coaching through the university, through the industry work, and um, when I engage with industry, um, the media, it's slightly exhilarating, slightly scary, um, but a bit fun as well. Uh, and I, my strategy is I need, I have three points, and I'm, I have those written down, and I'm mindful of not coming up with a terrible headline um, or something, so I really frame my uh, responses to try and stick to the message. And so I think it can be trained, and so... Um, now in our lab, we try and do um, these types of uh, mock questioning with our PhD students. And there's also things like three-minute thesis and other um, opportunities for PhD candidates to start thinking about communicating science um, in a way that is meaningful to a much broader audience. So yes, I think we have a role. I think we can train ourselves to do it. Um, and we kind of have a responsibility to share facts um, to make sure people um, know what the evidence is and um, are not misled um, in some cases. Closing words, George. I totally agree if I could quickly add two points in terms of um, media training. Um, one of the photos I put up in my first slides, Fresh Science is a great program. Try to get in there and get some media training experience going in there. Um, they actually put a camera there like this, um, showing you how to face the camera and not look at the camera itself um, and just be natural. And a lot of things going on in that program, and that's very valuable as well. Um, the other point I would like to add is that if you think about how nasty some reviews comments are, that we can still do, you know, be able to adjust. If you see something obviously untrue in the media, it's, it is, I think, our obligation to say, hey, this is not real. And the science community that we should actually go out there and, you know, correct them in a way that like, politely and not in the light too much, otherwise, they'll end up like some politicians <laughs> anyway um, sorry i'm going in the wrong direction but i don't mind you know things up in the end <laughs> thank you george and thank you everyone for a, an excellent uh present set of presentations um thank you jefferson thank you laura uh thank you george again uh and thank you to our audience um we have run over time so i had better finish uh, but if I could finish by also saying that our next event will be in November, I think the second, but I haven't written it down. Um, uh, certainly the first Thursday in November, uh, and it will be a joint event with the Royal Society of Victoria at the Royal Society of Victoria premises, and also in a joint event with the Science Teachers of Australia uh, organization. Uh, so it will be looking at the role of secondary education and, and STEM and how we build some of those skills. So I think it'll be a really interesting and informative evening, I uh, say, jointly with the science teachers of uh, Australia, so, or Victoria, one of the two. Um, and so would certainly uh, uh, invite you all to attend that evening. So otherwise, thank you. And we'll finish there. Thank you.